pues ya para arrancarnos de una vez, les cuento que nuestro primer ponente es de Los Ángeles, California, también ahí con un cambio de horario. Se despertó muy temprano para acompañarnos el día de hoy. Él es Matthew Manos, él es fundador y director general de Very Nice. Eh, como les cuento, es una estrategia de diseño eh, que dona la mitad de todo su trabajo a organizaciones sin fines de lucro. Entre algunos de sus clientes más importantes se encuentran Apple, las Naciones Unidas, Google eh, y la American Heart Association. Matthew también es profesor adjunto eh, de diseño en la Universidad del Sur de California y actualmente preside el consejo eh, del asesor creativo del alcalde de Los Ángeles, Eric Garcetti. Eh, pues vamos a darle la bienvenida a Matthew, ¿qué les parece? Hello Matthew, how are you? Welcome to Expo Red 2021. Eh, le dejamos la palabra a nuestro ponente. Bienvenidos. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, really means a lot to be here and to be able to share with you all. I want to share a story with you and the story starts with the date March 19th, 2020. My home city, Los Angeles, had just gone into lockdown. At the time, many of us thought this coronavirus thing would blow over in a month or so. Oh, were we wrong. And for brands, COVID-19's impact may never subside. Out of both boredom and fascination, I spent the month of March 2020 deciphering close to 100 press releases from various organizations. Like many of you, I spend a lot of time working in and with nonprofit organizations. So my curiosity was piqued when I started seeing those outside the sector shifting seemingly overnight to become more focused on creating social impact. In these memos, companies like Disney, Netflix, Vans, and Airbnb highlighted their responses to the virus. These responses included monetary and in-kind donations to support frontline workers, research, and the socioeconomic ripple effect of the disease. In addition, as we know, many nonprofit organizations quickly pivoted to address the crisis. So I stopped to ask myself, why do organizations create responses like these? And what is the real motivation here? Well, the intentionality of generosity in times of crisis can be summarized with a blend of the following. Fear of missing out or FOMO, a sincerity in, in a desire to actually help others, and mass product demonstration. When we're talking about fear of missing out, for some businesses, the intention behind launching a new impact initiative in a time of crisis can come from a sort of emotional gut reaction, especially in the case for those second and third wave actions. Fear of missing out can propel a business to action. And for some businesses, the source of this fear of missing out can come from a place of altruistic awakening. For others, it can come from a fear of competitive advantage or a tarnished brand image. With mass product demonstration, It's no surprise that one of the most common ways in which businesses got involved in the fight against COVID-19 is through in-kind donations and offerings of skilled labor. In doing so, these businesses create impact while simultaneously demonstrating how great their products are and how competent their teams are. This builds trust in the brand promise and output, ultimately building more long-term equity in public trust and perception for the business. And then sincerity. As one would hope, emergency pivots of factory operations and business focus, radical improvements of worker benefits, waiving CEO pay to secure jobs, and major financial gifts can come from a place of sincerity in the interest of maximizing impact and reducing pain. Marketing and branding are two terms that are mixed up quite a bit. My simple explanation for the difference between the two practices is that marketing is timely and branding is timeless. With marketing, you're creating work to that it's content, campaigns, et cetera, that resonate with a specific moment in time. With branding, you're ultimately defining who you are and what you stand for. I run a design strategy practice in Los Angeles called Very Nice. We launched in 2008 as one of the first examples of social entrepreneurship in the design services industry. We've worked with over 850 
different clients over the years, including the United Nations, Google, Apple, and the city of Los Angeles. Very Nice is most well known for our Give Half model. Every year, Very Nice gives half of its services away for free to nonprofit organizations. In addition, Very Nice has an open access model in which we have a commitment to publish all of our own intellectual property online in the form of toolkits. Through these models and thanks to a community of over 1,000 volunteers and partners, we've been able to offset over 43 million US dollars in consulting value. And so you might be wondering, what does Very Nice do? Well, when we first launched, we focused entirely on graphic design. However, as the years went by, we pivoted to focus more on the strategy behind the design. We do things like building brands and marketing campaigns, like this one for the AIDS life cycle, a bicycle ride that goes from San Francisco to Los Angeles, California, to raise money for the SF AIDS Foundation and the Los Angeles LGBT Center. We also develop products like this one for the Keep a Breast Foundation, which helps users perform self-check exams for breast cancer. And finally, we help organizations create new visions for the work that they want to do in the future and the future that they want to create. We recently worked with the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and the American Heart Association on large scale projects like this. While the corporate responses to COVID-19 certainly varied, there's one thing they all had in common. They were all timely. As a result, they were all marketing. But now it's time for corporations to take their work to the next level. And you might be wondering, what does this mean for nonprofit organizations? Well, if COVID-19 is triggering a responsible brand movement in the private sector, and if more and more companies begin to integrate impact models into their day-to-day -day mission, the line between the work and value of a nonprofit and of a for-profit may start to blur for consumers. Because of this, it's critical that nonprofit organizations work to develop a strong brand that can stand out from the growing crowd and communicate the value of its own work. And so I wonder, could 2020 be the year of the responsible brand? And could 2021 be the year that this even accelerates more? I've previously defined a responsible brand as a brand that knows what it stands for, has a business strategy that delivers on that purpose, and artfully demonstrates itself in the marketplace. In today's world, being a responsible brand is necessary. To start building your own responsible brand, consider the following. Organizational culture. What has your organization believed since day one? What is your purpose, mission, vision, and values? What is your big, hairy, audacious goal? Business strategy. A commitment to social responsibility cannot just be something you portray. It has to be something that you live. What does your business strategy look like? And how can your business model consider both impact and revenue? Brand marketing. What does your brand stand for above all else? What attributes make up your brand and how can your brand promise be ethical? So for today, I wanna to zoom in on brand marketing. I know that this is a topic of interest to many of you. In a toolkit that I co-authored with my friends at Riggs Partners in South Carolina last year, The Responsible Brand, we showcase a model for building a brand platform that includes five core elements. All five of these are things for you to think about regarding your own brand. First, the brand lure. This is the unmet need in the marketplace and how your organization meets that need differently or better than other organizations in your sector. It ultimately informs the position that you occupy in the market. Next, the brand promise. This is the end benefit to your customer, client, or constituent. The brand promise conveys that which they can depend on you to deliver time and time again. Brand essence. This is a word or two that relays your organization's core truth, the one enduring concept that is inextricably connected to the brand. 
For example, Very Nice has high standards for the work we produce for our clients. Brand drivers. The top competitive advantages or differentiators that serve as the framework for the brand's core messages. These ultimately inform product and service development, customer experience, and marketing strategy. And finally, brand attributes. These are descriptions of how your brand delivers on its promise. These attributes represent the spirit of the brand and inform the style and tone of marketing and communication deliverables that will follow. And so together, these five things can help you build a brand that is very cohesive and one that is going beyond just that initial identity or logo or tagline or whatever that might be. And instead, really thinking deeply about what it is that you can promise time and time again, what it is that you believe today and what you've always believed and how you can communicate that to others. And then ultimately, and I think one of the most important things, especially in this new context that we're living within, the top competitive advantages or differentiators. I know often when talking with nonprofit organizations, thinking about competitive advantages can feel sort of ironic, right? Ultimately, we're all trying to resolve some sort of massive cause. And don't we want to see everyone succeed? And that's true to an extent. But at the same time, many of our organizations are actually fighting for the same funding dollars. And so sadly, we do have to stand out and we do have to find ways that we can uh, you know, make ourselves unique in that marketplace. In addition, when we can nail these five things down, we can really build that customer trust and that client trust as well. I mentioned earlier that we have an open access model When Very Nice turned 10 years old uh, in 2018, I decided that I wanted to move from a give half model to challenge ourselves to having a give all model. Now, this started out sort of as a joke to myself because it sounded impossible, but what it turned into was the 10 toolkits that actually open source all of the different methodologies that we use with our clients. And so to learn more about this, I definitely recommend checking out GiveAll.io. But in this toolkit series, GiveAll, we've created a library of toolkits dedicated to making design strategy far less complex. Each download also includes a Spanish translation too, by the way, so thought I'd mention that. One of the toolkits included in the GiveAll series is focused entirely on brand strategy and identity. In it, we introduce a model for thinking about branding that we call the brand mandala. And as you can see here, the brand mandala has four different pieces, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. We first begin with the context of a brand, long before we start thinking about what is it that we're going to design, write, or make, or put out into the world. We're asking ourselves to reflect on the past, present, and future of the brand inspired by a methodology called the Futures Triangle, which was created by the futurist Sohail Inayatula. What this does is it allows us to imagine the future that we hope to work towards or that we hope to create, while also respecting the challenges that we're facing right now, today, and the history that either we are coming from or our industry is building upon. Once we understand the context that we're working within, we can begin to position ourselves at that point. And when we're talking about positioning as a brand, we're talking about identifying the specific people that we are trying to impact with our brand or that we are trying to ensure that our message reaches. In addition to the people side of positioning and ultimately selecting those folks, we're also thinking about the market and the industry and the other players. What is it that's going on? What are they doing? And again, going back to sort of that brand driver that we talked about, what are the top competitive advantages that we have that can help us differentiate and help those remember our brand? Once we've developed that context that we're working within, we're feeling confident about the position that we want to take and set for ourselves, we can begin to think about our identity. And this is when it gets sort of fun. We're thinking about language. We're thinking about imagery. 
these decisions that we're making on this more visual or communicative side are being driven by the previous two uh, parts of considering our brand. And finally, after all of this work, we can start thinking about touch points. A touch point is any time that your brand, literally or figuratively, touches someone. This can be things like a website, a logo, a brochure, social media, etc. We're thinking about how we can ultimately bring our life. How is it that we can communicate this context we're working within, reach the people that we are aiming to position ourselves with in a way that is bringing our identity to life? That is really the purpose of these touch points. So some best practices that I want to share when it comes to thinking about branding and, and building your brand in particular. First, I found that a strong brand is so clear that it can be built upon with very minimal efforts. It is something that people either internal or external to your organization can easily associate themselves with and feel empowered by. And this is a really important note that your brand is for your customers, your beneficiaries, your donors, but it is also for your team, right? It gives people a sense of place and community that they can feel very proud to be a part of. Second, your brand strategy captures the culture and purpose of an organization in a way that sets guidelines, but is flexible enough to allow people to contribute. This is also an important reminder. We're often thinking about a brand in the sense of very strict guidelines. We do want a brand to be timeless while our marketing is timely. And as a result, we want consistency. But when we create so much consistency that our team or our community doesn't feel like they have room to make it their own, we can find a little bit of a disconnect there. Third, it's important to see every piece of collateral that you create, right? Those brochures, those various touch points as an extension of the identity design that you've created. You wanna stay authentic to the identity and don't add things that are out of the scope of your brand guidelines. But when you do stray from your standard look and feel, be aware of the decisions you're making and do this with purpose, right? Going back to our concept earlier of having guidelines, but still maintaining that sense of flexibility. Next, you may have a lot of ideas for what you need for your brand. Don't be intimidated. Start with the most crucial items. Your experience with those items may inform your initial assumptions and make what you actually need a bit more clear to you. Next, a lot of brands try to incorporate tons of bells and whistles that distract from the key message. It's important to have a clear mission and purpose behind everything that you make. And for example, if, if your goal is to create something informational, people need to be able to receive that information above anything else. How is it that you can really focus your brand and the way that you're communicating your brand to ultimately get you to the place that you want to be? Also included in our Give All series and in the methods that we use at Very Nice with clients is a toolkit focused on marketing strategy and storytelling. In it, we introduce a model for thinking of marketing that looks like a pyramid. Uh, now, this one has four sections also to it, vision, people, accountability, and touch points. And I'm also going to walk through each of these to help you get a sense for how to develop your own marketing strategy. So first, very important is to begin with the vision for your marketing. Marketing is timely, right? We've, we've mentioned this before. And as a result, you can be doing a lot of different marketing campaigns, various moments, various times of year. And it's really easy to forget, hey, why are we even doing this? What are our goals, right? What are we trying to accomplish with our marketing? And so something that I really recommend long before saying, hey, we need to start a Facebook page, we need to create an Instagram, we need to create a TikTok, is to actually ask yourself why, right? What is it that we are trying to get out of this marketing campaign? What is our vision? Once you've set that, you can begin to think about the people that you're trying to ultimately reach. Uh, when we were looking at the brand strategy model, we, there was a section called position. And this is kind of similar to that. With marketing, knowing who you are speaking to is really critical as it allows for you to really empathize 
with that user and create content that is going to ultimately attract them to you. And so in the people phase of creating your marketing strategy, we recommend developing user profiles, uh, as well as even more importantly, going out and talking to your customers. Find out what is it that they're doing this time of year? What do they care about? Um, what is their current relationship with your brand? In what way are they sort of confused by what it is that you offer? Uh, in what way are they very, very clear on what you offer? These kinds of things coupled with your vision and really identifying that end goal can help you craft messages that are accessible and that ultimately get you to where you want to be. One of the really important phases and something very unique about marketing compared to branding is with marketing, you can really hold yourself accountable uh, in, in a much more clear way. With branding, it's very hard to measure the success of your work unless you wait for years to come and you really see that relationship with your brand grow, the way in which people interpret your brand grow, etc. But with marketing, because it's so timely and it can be even a week long or a day long or a month long campaign, you can actually very specifically measure the success of your work. And this is something that I love about marketing. You know, if you are doing right, you can hold yourself accountable. There's many ways to do this. Uh, one way is by tracking the increase of awareness of your brand, right? You can take a look before and after your campaign how many people visited your website or followed your social media page, uh, et cetera. You can also measure things like activation, uh, how many people did something because of this campaign, how many people clicked on something, right? You can also measure things like revenue, uh, how much money in donations or in purchases did this campaign uh, give you? And then finally, you can measure things like referrals. So in what way were people able to actually tell others about your brand and how did you incentivize that as well? So again, because marketing is so timely, it's measurable and that's a really nice thing about it. So, so far we've talked about vision, people and accountability. And it's really critical for me to underscore that these are all very connected. The people that we speak to are very much aligned with the vision that we establish. The goals that we set are also very much aligned with the vision that we establish. So it really begins with that question of why are we doing this? And then just like our brand strategy model, we end in touch points. Uh, and this is, you know, again, thinking about, okay, what is it that we can now create? Again, kind of the fun part. What sort of content will we write? What sort of imagery will we use, et cetera? All influenced by these previous three strategic discussions and explorations. You'll notice that with both my marketing strategy model and my brand strategy model, touch points is at the end. And it's really important for me to emphasize how critical this is because it's so common for us to say, hey, I guess I need to create a social media campaign for my nonprofit organization. And then just starting to do it and you don't actually see results, you don't know how to measure the work, et cetera. When we actually start with that vision piece and we slow down the process of getting to that end result, we can create something that is ultimately much more successful for us and much more strategically aligned with where we want to go as an organization as well. So some best practices with marketing that I would love to share. First, don't jump to the tactical approach of your marketing campaign too quickly. Very similar to what I was just speaking about. It's always important to start by asking yourself why you are launching this campaign in the first place. Next, consider the audience for this campaign in order to help you determine which approaches for disseminating this message will be most powerful. Another important best practice is, is to always meet your users where they are. Marketing strategy at its core is the ability to give yourself the chance to understand the audience's needs and reflect the understanding through words and images. Your marketing campaign is not for you, it's for the people that you serve, right? So why not involve them in that process? Third, don't feel like you need to be on every available platform just because everyone else is. This is one of the most common stressors for many nonprofit organizations, is not having enough bandwidth to actually do everything. 
And so I'm here to tell you, don't do everything, right? Every platform comes with its pros and cons, and those should be dictated by your vision or the visions and the needs of the end users that you've identified. Fourth, a marketing campaign, at, you know, as it's running, it's important to be sure to keep track of your goals and units for success measurement in order to evaluate the campaign through its lifespan instead of just at the completion. So this is really great uh, you know, advice because as you're running a marketing campaign, you can actually quickly pivot and fine tune as you go based on the real data that you're collecting. Next, stay open to a range of approaches for disseminating your message. Experiment frequently and try all kinds of things until something sticks. Once something sticks though, do not get complacent. Marketing is both exciting and terrifying because the platforms constantly change. And so it's important that you always choose the platform that your intended audience frequents, not the one that you're most comfortable with. And this is some of the hardest advice and some of the scariest advice that I'll give because it's so easy to get into that comfort zone with our work, right? Finally, our marketing strategy that is less successful puts organizational goals ahead of and out of sync with the needs of the audience. So for example, donate now is not always a useful way to lead, right? In fact, it can feel a bit rude sometimes. So instead, find ways to get the user to empathize with the issue first. One of the most powerful things about nonprofit organizations in the hundreds that I've worked with in my career that I feel like they do not sort of play up enough is that you all as nonprofit organizations are story keepers. You have incredible stories to tell of both great triumph and of tragedy. And these are stories that you can really leverage in an ethical way to inspire audiences to participate in your work. And that's so much more powerful than the first messages that you say to someone is, hey, can we have some money, right? So think about that. Remember that your audience may or may not be familiar with your cause or core differentiation or offering. This is especially the case as your audience begins to grow. As a result, it is important to frequently find creative ways to share basic information about your organization with your audience. One very common mistake that I see nonprofit organizations make is on their donate page, they actually don't have any information about what they do. And this is because there's an assumption that other people had gone through other pages on the website before getting to that donate page. But you need to always ask yourself in developing a website or creating any touch point, how can I educate this end user, um, you know, as efficiently as possible? Keep it simple and to the point. Stay true and clear to the call to action and visions for your campaign. Don't expect one message to communicate everything. So again, marketing is very much about trying all kinds of things. And the more that you work at this, the more simple it will be to really refine that message and keep it as simple and short as possible. So I hope that showcasing these methods and best practices, you can begin to think differently about your brand, that which is timeless, and your marketing, that which is timely. And I invite you to celebrate this work and, and do this work yourself uh, with access to everything that we've created again for free. We don't get anything out of sharing that with you. So I do hope that you take advantage of that. COVID-19 has changed the game for brands and business leaders to make a difference in the lives of your team members, customers, constituents in the world around you is no longer a fun, timely marketing campaign. It has to be something that is lived, that is baked into the heart and soul of your organization. And so I wanna leave you today with some questions for you to think about. First, how can you build a brand that is timeless? And second, how can you create marketing that is timely? And third, how can your brand and marketing allow you to realize your goals of creating as much impact as possible? So I want you to think about these questions as you move forward in your work. And I just wanna say thank you so much uh, for having me and I hope that we can stay in touch and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Matthew. 
Bueno, tenemos varios comentarios de, de, de nuestro público. Adolfo de Chihuahua nos comenta, wow, gracias Matthew, qué interesante lo que comentas. Muchas veces no sabemos cómo comunicar lo que hacemos y justamente es para esto es esta plática, ¿no? Sobre lo que Mati nos explicaba de la diferencia entre un branding y un marketing y que hoy en día es muy importante y más por estos temas de digitalización a través de este, a consecuencia de la pandemia, cómo tenemos que impactar, cómo tenemos que hacer buenas estrategias para que esa marca que queremos nosotros promocionar, pues se quede en la mente y por qué no hasta en el corazón del, de la gente, ¿no? Entonces, es sumamente importante para aquellas organizaciones que no saben cómo expresar, cómo manifestar o cómo, cómo decir lo que están haciendo, este, porque muchas veces tienen, pueden tener muy buenas intenciones, pero a veces no saben cómo comentarlo. Entonces, muy, muy, muy buena esta, esta, esta plática. Y bueno, ahora coméntanos quién es el, el siguiente ponente que vamos a tener el día de hoy. 